I just want to welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm Dan Rockmore, currently the acting director at the Wright Center for the Study of Computation and Just Communities. Um, and uh, uh, for my faculty uh, colleagues uh, in the audience, I do just want to point out that this is among the events that are being sponsored by the Wright Center. I encourage you all to uh, come to me uh, with your ideas as we're willing, as we're very interested in supporting work uh, broadly um, interpreted as being at the nexus of computation and justice, just communities. And today's lecture uh, from David Mindich uh, of Temple uh, kicks off a series of lectures at a very important uh, place in that juncture, which is the uh, intersection of propaganda, fake news, um, and narrative, uh, and the way in which computation fuels that, the way in which that affects justice. Um, and so that's just an instance of the kinds of uh, things, uh, the kinds of ideas that we do hope to support uh, on campus. Um, uh, I am delighted at this kickoff event uh, to have Susan and Jim Wright here. So Susan and Jim, thanks for your uh, Thanks for being here, and also thanks for uh, the guidance and uh, the work that you've done for the college and um, being part of the center. So thank you. Um, all right, so that's, so that's kind of it. So I do want to welcome you to the, what is a kickoff of Wright Center activities for the year. And with that, uh, I want to hand off to my colleague, Petra McGillan, who's going to give a proper introduction to our speaker and to the topic of the day. Thank you, Petra. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan, and uh, you know, exits over there, drinks later. Um, so, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming. My name is Petra McGillen, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of German Studies. And it is my great honor to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture in our new lecture series, Fake News and Narrative, Histories, Interventions, Controversies. And as Dan just pointed out, the lecture series is part of an interdisciplinary working group that my colleagues Lynn Paddock, Dan Rockmore, and I co-founded just a few months ago on fake news, propaganda, and narrative force. And that is housed in the Susan and James Wright Center for the Study of Computation and Just Communities. Our working group brings together the multidisciplinary research that is happening on our campus on the relationship of fake news, propaganda, and storytelling as forces that create social climate and drive social thought and action. It seeks to fill a gap in so far as at Dartmouth, we don't have a department of journalism studies. What we do have, however, is a great number of colleagues engaging with the fake news epidemic from an astonishing number of fields and a variety of perspectives. I'm therefore all the more grateful to the Wright Center for enabling us to bring this research together under one intellectual roof, so to speak, and for generously supporting this lecture series. I'd also like to acknowledge Christine Monagle and David Merker for their tireless administrative support of our working group activities. And I am beyond excited that for our inaugural event, David Mindich will be speaking to us. David is the chair of the journalism department at the Klein College of Media and Communications at Temple University in Philadelphia. Forget Philly, however, I am tempted to claim him as a local. Not just because before joining Temple, he was a journalism professor at St. Michael's College in Colchester, Vermont, uh, and that for about two decades, but also because in his media and American politics class, he regularly takes his students to our neck of the woods to cover the New Hampshire primaries, which I think is one of the greatest teaching ideas um, in the history of journalism school. <laughs> His academic work focuses on the history of journalism and in particular, the emergence of objectivity. That weird and slippery concept that to some represents the highest achievement of modern American journalism, while to others, it simply represents modern journalism's golden calf. His first book, Just the Facts, How Objectivity Came to Define American Journalism, published in 1998 by New York University Press, gave the field a new way of looking at one of its key concepts. In journalism, objectivity is typically understood as the lack of certain qualities, the lack of bias, the lack of embellishment, etc. David shows, however, that objectivity is actually an active enterprise. Journalists do not just mirror the world, they do things when they report on what's happening. 
After just the facts, David published two more books, Tuned Out, Why Americans Under 40 Don't Follow the News, which appeared with Oxford University Press in 2004, and The Mediated World, A New Approach to Mass Communication and Culture, Roman and Littlefield, 2019. So this is actually a textbook. And he's finishing up a manuscript with the working title, The First Disruptors, How James Gordon Bennett and a Small Group of Journalists Invented the Modern Newspaper, which I'm guessing will take up the concept or the question of objectivity anew. To say that his work has been well received would be an understatement. He was honored with a number of awards, including the Kriegbaum Under 40 Award with, for Outstanding Teaching, Scholarship, and Service, which he received from the AEJMC in 2002, and that, that's one of the field's highest honors. And in 2011, he was named the New England Journalism Educator of the Year. You see, that's why I want to claim him as a local. <laughs> David's approach, however, is not confined to the academy. He also brings the practitioner's perspective to his research and teaching. David worked as a freelance correspondent and then later as an assignment editor for CNN in New York City and still contributes to a number of media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Los Angeles Times, to name but a few. His talk today grew out of the intersection of his academic interests and his personal experience. On his first day as an assignment editor at CNN, he was told that, and I quote from his abstract, a fire in a welfare hotel does not have the same news value as a fire in the Waldorf Hotel, end of quote, which prompted him to question how factors such as national identity and bigotry impact reporting. In his talk today, he will take us to the battles between fake news and truth as they played out in the coverage of lynching in the 1890s. And he will show us how the historical case study from the 19th century resonates with journalism in the era of Black Lives Matter. The title of his talk is Which Lives Matter in the News? A Call for a Truer Mirror. Please help me welcome David Mindich. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, thank you to um, Dan Rockmore, Lynn Paddock, and um, Petra McGillan. Um, thank you to the Wright Center. Um, I had this amazing day today um, where uh, I met with uh, the fellows of the Newcomb Center, um, really brilliant postdocs. Um, and uh, then I met with undergraduates who were creating a podcast, and they asked brilliant questions. And, it's just a real pleasure to be here. Um, as Petra mentioned, I come every four years to New Hampshire, bring some students to, um, uh, to witness the presidential primaries. Uh, so you'll probably see me uh, back here in uh, two or three years. Um, it's, uh, th that's one of the thrills of my career, to, to witness um, with students and through their eyes uh, this amazing uh, uh, a moment of democracy every four years. Um, I want to uh, talk for about uh, 30 or 40 minutes about uh, a form of fake news that's so pervasive um, that it's difficult for us all to see. Um, it's the fake or bold, uh, bogus um, uh, worldview a society can fall into when people are left out of the story or left out of the creation of a story. And this is a story of diversity and what happens when there is no diversity. Uh, and after I thoroughly depress you for about a half an hour, um, I'm hoping to offer a little bit of hope at the end as well. Um, okay. So this is an image um, from uh, the 19th century, an interpretation of um, the shield of Achilles um, and Homer's epic story, uh, the Iliad, um, provides the section where um, Homer describes the shield of Achilles, which is supposed to be a reflection of the world. And when I was an undergraduate, I saw, uh, I read this um, in the Iliad, and I thought, wow, how remarkable it would be to have a shield that reflects the whole world. What would that look like, even? Um, and I thought about that, 
um, and I still think about it, uh, both as a former uh, Simon editor for CNN and as a journalism professor, um, what does it mean when a shield or a mirror or journalism itself tries to reflect um, a whole world? So fast forward from Homer to 2021. Um, this is an image um, of the uh, New York Post, and we're now in the third month of obsessing nationally about Gabby Petito, uh, a woman who was killed on a trip with her fiance. And a perfectly reflective shield would let us know about all the missing women, not just the ones with blue eyes. Instead, we suffer from what the late great journalist Gwen Ifill once called missing white woman syndrome. If there's a missing white woman, Eiffel said, you're going to cover that every day. And when I got my start at CNN um, in 1986, there was a murder of a white teenager named Jennifer Levin. Um, and her story ran on the front page of the Metro section and then on the front page of their A1 section in the New York Times every single day. CNN, as it often does, followed suit. Um, and by way of explanation, um, a bunch of white editors said, she could have been my daughter. She could have been my daughter. And that, and that, and that we, should, we should celebrate that kind of empathy that comes from an editor or a reporter. Um, but at the time, there were five murders a day in New York City, and um, four of them couldn't have been the daughter of, uh, of the New York Times editors and reporters. Uh, so why, if there are five murders a day, why was only one resonating in the New York Times cover and nationally? At that time, um, we used to get faxes every day, fax machines for, <laughs> Most of you are old enough to know what a fax machine is, but um, uh, <laughs> fax machine uh, uh, messages would come every day from the police, um, and they would describe uh, a murder that, that, that crossed their path. Uh, and again, we'd get like five of these every day. And one of them was a woman who was found, uh, whose body was found on the rooftop, uh, on a rooftop in Harlem. Um, she, her, her brassiere was wrapped around her neck. It, it had um, all of the earmarks of a sensational story, but we didn't cover it. We kept on going with Jennifer Levin. And I, rem I remember uh, as a young guy uh, starting off at CNN saying, hey, why don't we ask the black press why we're not covering um, uh, this story and we're just covering Jennifer Levin. Uh, I sent in a pr formal proposal. Um, it never ran for a whole bunch of reasons, but um, it never ran. Um, and although I didn't know the phrase at the time, I did ask myself a version of which lives matter. Like what, why, why Jennifer Levin and not this, um, not this woman. Um, journalism textbooks typically um, list seven news values um, and they are impact, emotional appeal, conflict, timeliness, proximity, prominence, and the unusual. So if you're studying journalism and you're looking for elements that make a story big, here are some of the seven uh, typical uh, elements. And prominence means that we care more about the lives of the famous than others. And this is an example here from the Titanic headline. When the Titanic uh, went down, the New York Times wrote, probably 1,250 perish. Ismay safe, Mrs. Astor maybe. Uh, and Ismay was the head of the Titanic shipping line and, um, and Astor was um, uh, a well-known wealthy woman who had just married um, uh, what's, what now would be a billionaire. Um, and the rich has, have always gotten more attention, uh, the rich and famous have always gotten more attention than the rest of us. There's this great um, New York Post parody headline from the 1990s, and it goes something like, Kaboom, World War III, Michael Jackson, comma, 80 million perish. 
<laughs> um, so, and as uh, uh, Petra mentioned, um, you know, when I first came uh, to CNN, somebody told me that a fire in a welfare hotel is not as big as a fire in the Waldorf Hotel. Again, questions about which lives matter. Um, now, um, proximity um, means that we care more about the people who are nearby. Um, a sign in a London tabloid from about 100 years ago read, one Englishman is a story, 10 Frenchmen is a story, 100 Germans is a story, and nothing ever happens in Chile. <laughs> Um, you know, it, on one hand, I, I, I kind of love how ridiculous it is, um, it just because it's very funny, but also, you know, these, are, these have huge and sad consequences for the way we look at the world. Um, we can understand and justify um, uh, proximity. Um, we care more about Hanover, New Hampshire, than Hanover, Germany, in part because we can do more, right? If you're a member of the New Hampshire um, uh, community, uh, the Hanover uh, New Hampshire community, you can actually make changes, right, um, here. You can probably have less of a political impact uh, on the doings of Hanover, Germany. Um, but we have to guard against the idea of, I mean, if we, if we can accept that proximity is important, we have to guard against the idea of cultural proximity. The idea that, um, that we ignore people who don't look like us or sound like us or come from the same place that we're, uh, that we're from. Um, and there have been some strides in newsroom diversity over the last 20 years. Um, we know that a minority of newsrooms have increased both gender and racial uh, diversity, but a majority have not. Um, and in no case, even the, the newsrooms that have improved um, their diversity, um, there are very few newspapers around the country which have a diversity that matches the diversity of the city that they cover. Um, so we still have a long way to go. So when I left CNN, I went to grad school to study history, and I learned that predominantly white, um, the predominantly white press in the United States has long been making crude calculations about which lives matter. The New York Sun, the first truly independent newspaper founded in 1833, had this beautiful, famously inclusive motto. And the motto was, the sun shines for all. But then in 1846, when an African-American man submitted an article to that newspaper, he was charged an advertising fee, and the editor explained, the sun shines for all white men and not for colored men. The exclusion of minority voices was, most, uh, was felt most acutely, of course, by minority groups themselves, and in 1827, uh, John Rus Russworm and Samuel Cornish published the first periodical edited by African Americans. And in their first issue, they wrote, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. The black press uh, served and continues to serve many functions. It's a gathering place. It gives African Americans a place to write to notice, to be noticed. It's a place for business and politics. Uh, and it fills voids. It's not filling the voids of the uh, mainstream white owned press is not the only function of the black press, but it's a function. Um, it offers a corrective to, um, uh, to the failings of the mainstream white press. A whites only press can never be a true mirror and it never was. Uh, during the run-up to the uh, American Civil War, even the otherwise progressive Harper's Weekly regularly depicted African Americans in gross caricature. Interestingly enough, as African Americans were needed more in the Civil War um, effort from the North, um, they were depicted 
in more humanistic ways. But this didn't last forever. When, um, when black people um, weren't caricatured, they were often ignored through history. Um, Robert Darnton, uh, a leading historian, tells a story about how he, um, he talked to a detective about a story that he thought was really great, and the detective said, uh, you know, there's a B after these names. Don't you know that that's not a story? And uh, Darton said, I had no idea that, um, that stories with a B after their name de denoting that uh, the people were African American um, uh, didn't have any news value. So um, as a young man, he was told that, given that lesson in journalism in the 1950s very uh, concretely. Since then, before his time, it's a, pretty, um, it's a pretty consistent story in American history about the way African Americans were, were left out of the mirror. Um, and now we go, um, if we jump ahead, um, from, uh, from the founding of, um, of African American newspapers um, uh, to the 1890s, um, again, with this consistent shutting out of, um, of the story of African Americans, we uh, get to the story in the 1890s of lynching. The lynching is one of the most terrible um, periods in American history, a time when um, white mobs would actively um, surround and torture and kill African American men. Um, and uh, we know that uh, that it was either ignored or covered poorly by, um, by the um, uh, mainstream press. And here is an example of the New York Times coverage of lynching. Um, on one hand, uh, the New York Times said the, um, sorry, I missed my notes here. On one hand, um, the New York Times um, said that the lynch mobs were, um, were savages. So that's reasonable uh, and the only way to look at, at the, the terrible um, events of lynching. On the other hand, the New York Times offered this little bit of uh, racism. The crime for which Negroes have frequently been lynched and occasionally been put to death with frightful tortures is a crime to which Negroes were particularly prone. Um, and even though this is a deeply racist um, uh, statement, I bet that the editors themselves thought that there was some kind of weird balance there, right? So on one hand, you condemn the lynch mob. On the other hand, you disparage the African-American victims. Um, and uh, this racist construction might have seemed fair to the editors, but it was, um, it was deeply built based on a racist worldview that they were buying into. And I'm gonna go into that in a second. But um, NYU professor Jay Rosen said, um, talked about the idea of objective journalists uh, defending themselves by saying that they, they, their view is a view from nowhere. Like this protection of your craft by saying, well, I don't have a, per, uh, a particular point of view. I don't see race, um, to borrow the phrase of a, a novel by James McBride, the color of water uh, is what objective journalists claim that they see, right? I mean, that, that there's something absent, there's something um, that they can talk about the wor in, in the world that's absent of perspective. They don't have particular goggles. Um, they just see the world as it is. Um, but we know that, um, that everyone does have a perspective. And the assertion that journalists have a view from nowhere um, reminds me of a story from a few years ago. There was a reporter named Lewis, um, Lewis Raven Wallace who wrote a blog post. He was a reporter for NPR, wrote a blog post about uh, Trump's inauguration. And he wrote, neutrality is impossible for me as a member of a marginalized community, he said, I am transgender. I never had an opportunity to pretend I can be neutral. 
Wallace was fired from NPR a few days later um, and has subsequently wrote a book about, um, about the view from nowhere and how dangerous it is uh, for journalists who are uh, um, in communities that are under threat. So it was Ida B. Wells who, um, who then um, fought against these misperceptions about lynching. And I love talking about Ida B. Wells. Um, uh, I try to be a detached um, <laughs> historian, but whenever I think about Ida B. Wells, I get really excited because she's maybe the most courageous journalist in American history. Um, she, uh, she was born an enslaved person in 1862. Uh, she, her parents died um, in a uh, yellow fever epidemic when she was 16. And people were saying that we should you know, separate the, the children, but she said, no, I'll take care of all of my siblings. Um, she did, she became a teacher at a young age, um, and then she was riding on this train um, when she was, I think, 22 years old, riding on this train, and the conductor wanted her, because she was black, to go into another car, the smoking car. She refused. The conductor grabbed her. She bit his arm and uh, then sued the railroad. Uh, unfortunately, she, she won the first case, and then the Tennessee um, uh, Supreme Court overturned it, unfortunately. But she wrote about this, and she transitioned from teacher to journalist. Um, and in writing about the case, she became a, a well-known um, journalist. And in 1892, a friend of hers was lynched. Um, outside of Tennessee. Um, and Wells started to discover things about lynching um, that really no one had been talking about. She conducted an amazing town-by-town -town investigation of the root causes of lynching, at great risk to her. Um, she went, she talked to um, uh, eyewitnesses, she checked out the scene, she talked to victims' families, and she published a series of articles and pamphlets that presented clear evidence that um, so much of what the nation assumed about black culpability was false and based on racist lies. She discovered four things. Number one uh, was that rape was not the stated cause in most cases, even though it was popular, popularly imagined in the white press that that was the cause of, of um, of uh, lynching. Number two, when rape was charged, it was generally done so after the lynching took place as a way to justify the lynching. Number three, in most cases when a sexual uh, relationship was in fact real, it was actually between consenting adults. Uh, she went to one small town and she discovered that uh, one black man was uh, lynched for having raped a seven-year-old girl but she went to the town and discovered that actually the, it was a grown woman and they were in a consenting relationship. So it was all based on lies. And number four, the root cause of lynching was often economic competition and kind of a white terrorism to kind of uh, uh, frighten the um, uh, uh, African-American business people um, into um, uh, leaving uh, leaving town and um, avoiding this competition. In fact, Ida B. Wells' friend, a man named Thomas Moss, had opened up a grocery store with, with two friends, um, and uh, three African-American men opening up a grocery store near a white-owned grocery store, and they were lynched, um, uh, pr presumably, uh, not presumably, but, but Wells found that um, that you know, this comp economic competition was connected um, uh, to uh, the violence against them. In 1892, um, Wells wrote an unsigned editorial that would provoke calls for um, Wells's death. They didn't know, um, it was unsigned, so they didn't know her gender. They called for her castration, um, and um, the mobs destroyed the press and threatened her life. 
Um, and the editorial reads, Nobody in this section believes the old threadbare lie that Negro men assault white women. If Southern white men are not careful, a conclusion will be reached which will be very damaging to the moral reputation of their women. And for her efforts, um, Wells was met with incredulity. I mean, aside from the, you know, the immediate response, which was to destroy her press and run her out of town, um, the, uh, the New York Times uh, and others um, used her argument um, to insult her. Um, this is what the New York Times said in 1894. They called her a slanderous and nasty-minded mulattress who does not scruple to represent the victims of black brutes in the South as willing victims. And even though Ida B. Wells had drawn conclusions from her own excellent and unimpeachable town-to-town -to -town, uh, firsthand reporting, the New York Times saw her as nasty-minded. And what was going on here? Um, as a black woman, her reporting and her conclusions were outside of the white male notions of respectability and objectivity. Um, the largest 19th century newspapers were um, populated almost exclusively by white people, um, and uh, mainly men. Women were kind of shunted to the society pages. Um, and hard news was the purview of, of white men there's like a cult of masculinity going on there. Um, and she was not believed, even though um, her reporting was firsthand and no one ever was able to disprove any of the facts that she uncovered. Um, the uh, uh, man on the, on the left is uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, probably the greatest civil rights um, figure in the 19th century. Um, and even he believed some of the lies that were put forth um, by the mainstream press. He said to Ida B. Wells when he finally met her, he said, um, you know, he thanked her for her reporting and said, you know, even he was, was, tra was troubled by um, uh, what he uh, assumed was uh, culpability on the part of uh, African Americans in the crimes that they were accused of, of um, perpetrating. So um, Ida B. Wells' reporting uh, had a big effect on, um, on even Frederick Douglass. And if Frederick Douglass, again, one of the leading African American figures of the 19th century, believed some of the lies, you can sure as heck bet that, um, that almost everyone in America bought into this. And this is like the fake news um, that had kind of a national, um, a national um, uh, uh, misperception about, um, about African Americans. Now, you know, I'd like to say that, um, that uh, Ida B. Wells you know, changed the world, and, and she did, but I'd like to say that it changed all the perceptions of all the white people in America, but that's not true, right? So 20 years after um, she did her investigations. Uh, there was this movie, Birth of a Nation, which um, was, was interesting in terms of uh, the, the, the technical parts of, of the movie, but was based on this racist lie um, that, um, that the Ku Klux Klan would march in and, and save America um, and save the, the white maidens against the uh, invented crimes of African Americans. So, um, so uh, Ida B. Wells was able to really convince people in the black community that this was an issue, but she wasn't able to change um, uh, the the lies perpetrated and believed widely in the United States. Um, and um, we see this also um, after Birth of a Nation. You know the Emmett Till case in the 1950s, where uh, Emmett Till was this teenager who was killed by a white mob, um, uh, again, um, based on a series of lies. Uh, Jet Magazine and other people in the black press were, um, uh, other, uh, uh, other outlets in the black press were, um, were able to expose Emmett Till's, um, uh, the, the atrocities against Emmett Till, 
um, uh, in part because Emmett Till's mother um, insisted on an open casket for her son, um, a really uh, awful and courageous um, uh, moment in um, uh, the history of uh, African American um, uh, African American history. Um, and then uh, we see this even in uh, the late 20th century with, um, with the uh, bogus arrest of five teenagers, the Central Park Five, um, uh, who were coerced uh, into confessing to a crime. And we see here on the right, um, there was this uh, New York City real estate guy. His name was um, Donald Trump, who, uh, who um, put out ads um, bring back the death penalty for um, for these um, these five um, people, and um, and they were all um, railroaded into um, you know uh, convictions, uh, in part because of um, this pervasive uh, misperception about African Americans. You know the quote was that they were wilding. That was the term at the time. Um, they weren't seen as kids, but as w a wolf pack. That was another term that they used. Um, and this skewed vision of their place in society was based on um, years, decades, centuries of lies about African Americans. Um, and the lie persists today. Um, we see with every death of an unarmed um, a black victim from Trayvon Martin to Eric Garner to George Floyd, we see a demonization taking place. Um, we know that speaking out against it is maybe the modern equivalent of Jet and Ebony Magazine, um, Black, Li um, Black Lives Matter and Black Twitter, courageous journalists holding up cell phones for, uh, to videotape, um, showing a, a part of the mirror that, that maybe wouldn't have been uh, shown without them. And ultimately, an Achilles shield that reflects the world is a fantasy. If journalism is a mirror, its reflection can distort, like a funhouse mirror. In some cases, the mirror amplifies, like when we're talking about the wealthy, the famous, and groups that look like the journalists who cover them. In some cases, the mirror distorts, uh, affected by the baggage that journalists and consumers bring to a story. And in some cases, the mirror doesn't reflect at all. It's like the old uh, legendary vampires that when they look in, when they pass a mirror, their reflections can't be captured. Um, some individuals and groups are completely uh, invisible. And in the end, it boils down to which vision of humanity we embrace, the caricature or the one based on an understanding of our common uh, humanity. It's a picture of a funhouse mirror. <laughs> um, it's a question of, of tremendous consequence. Um, in a book that came out last year called The Survival of the Friendliest, which I highly recommend, um, the, uh, the authors Brian Hare and Vanessa Woods talk about the advantages of friendliness, of cooperation, and of a sense of common humanity. But they also talk about a really scary flip side. The flip side is that when humans see threats to themselves, um, they can turn on each other with unspeakable cruelty. From pogroms to the Holocaust, to slavery, the Trail of Tears, 19th century brutality, and even the death of George Floyd. Um, before people and governments become cruel and violent, they dehumanize. They make their victims into animals, insects, vermin, subhuman. The Nazis did it and slavers did it. And in recent times, uh, we heard one commentator, Brian Kilmeade, um, talk about the child detention policy and said, like it or not, these are not our kids. They're people from another country. When we make children others, their lives matter less. So I presented a really depressing vision uh, of the mirror of representation and the way that the media can lead to dehumanization. 
Um, but let me talk for another five or 10 minutes about a flip side. And the flip side is um, the promise that diversity affords. In um, 1953, James Baldwin published my favorite essay of his. Uh, it's called Stranger in the Village. Um, and here's an image of, uh, of Baldwin surrounded by a lot of whiteness <laughs> in a Swiss village in, uh, in 1953. Um, and here's Baldwin's delicious sentence describing the backwoods isolation of his town. I just love his writing. Um, and so here's, 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 the, here's the sentence. Um, in the village, there is no movie house, no bank, no library, no theater, very few radios, one Jeep, one station wagon, and at the moment, one typewriter, mine, an invention which the woman next door to me had never seen. <laughs> um, and because of the complete absence of black people in this, in this village, you know, there was something refreshing for Baldwin about being in a place that he didn't have to um, you know, deal with the daily um, uh, violence um, that he found in the United States. But Baldwin, while never excusing the racism in the United States, you know, the awful, scabby, dreadful racism of the United States, ultimately he found that the Swiss village, had, um, in its laboratory pure whiteness, had really nothing to offer the world. As a black man, Baldwin wrote, he was a stranger in the, the Swiss village, but not in America. Here are Baldwin's words. One of the things that distinguishes Americans from other people is that no other people has ever been so deeply involved in the lives of black men and vice versa. It is precisely this black-white experience which may prove of indispensable value to us in the world we face today. The world is white no longer and will never be white again." Unquote. And in this way, I think we should see diversity as not only an antidote to the unnatural whiteness of being, but also as an opportunity to tell a deeper and richer story. So I believe the way forward must include four key steps, and let me briefly outline them. First is an investigation of diversity and coverage. In June, 19, uh, uh, in June 2020, following the death of George Floyd and the protests that followed, the Philadelphia Inquirer ran an article about how destroying important buildings through looting can harm neighborhoods. The article was a, a thoughtfully written story, um, but it was accompanied by a terrible headline, and here it is. Buildings matter too. <laughs> Um, two days later, after Buildings Matter 2 ran, um, reporters and editors of color called in, quote, sick and tired. Um, two days after that, the executive editor, Stan Wisnowski, resigned, and the Inquirer commissioned an audit of newsroom, uh, of its newsroom makeup and of its coverage. Uh, I'm really proud that the audit was conducted by a team of Temple professors um, led by um, Brian Monroe, the person on the left. Brian actually, um, before um, the investigation was completed, um, uh, Brian uh, died of an untimely heart attack. Um, he was an amazing man, um, the head of the uh, National Association of Black Journalists, um, the former editor of Ebony and Jet, um, and Andrea Wenzel, the person on the right, who uh, specializes in um, uh, diversity and um, uh, listening to people in communities um, and uh, promoting uh, community engagement. The Temple team found that the Inquirer had too few black reporters and editors, and it also found that the newspaper did not include enough diverse voices in its stories. Uh, at the same time, um, WHYY, the NPR affiliate in Philadelphia, has undergone a systematic review of the people that reporters talk to when they're out on the street. Um, 
and this supposedly is making a big difference um, where you know, when a reporter realizes that he or she is being monitored for who they speak to, uh, they start to pay attention. Like, am I talking to enough people who don't look exactly like me or sound exactly like me? Um, so uh, the second thing that, uh, that I think that we should embrace is the practice of listening. Um, there are, uh, around uh, Philadelphia, around the country, but I th I'm noticing this a lot in Philadelphia, is this practice of tabling. Um, we know that journalism is pretty good at being a, a strobe light, like shining like fast uh, bursts of light at, at things, so um, we can see something very clearly in a moment, but it's probably less um, effective at showing a uh, sustained light, let's say a search light, um, at problems. And when you do tabling, you actually go around, you listen, you set up a table, you ask people what stories in their communities uh, they value. This is an image of students setting up a table in a place called Kensington. Uh, Kensington is a neighborhood in Philadelphia that's known for um, drugs and crime. Um, and uh, this Kensington initiative was started by a colleague of mine named Jillian Bauer-Reese, and she created something called the Kensington Voice, and she was upset that only crime and drugs were uh, reflected in uh, the Philadelphia media. So she set up the Kensington Voice, uh, had lots of tabling, listened to the people in the community, whether it's citizens or activists or educators, um, and part of it is, is listening. Part of her listening, she decided to have a, um, a uh, issue devoted to love. Um, now, should drugs and, and, and crime be reflected in this particular um, coverage of this neighborhood? Yes, absolutely, because um, it's, it's part of life. Um, but love is part of life too, right? People also fall in love in Kensington. And so I, I loved what she did with this, but you know, listening to um, listening to people talk about their stories includes stories of um, of love. The third way of four that I think we need to improve our coverage um, is to be honest about the limits of objectivity. Um, when the New York Times excluded and disparaged Ida B. Wells. They did so because they doubted her ability to be a reliable witness. In turn, the Times put itself forward as the only reliable witness. And earlier I mentioned Jay Rosen's statement, um, thoughts about the view from nowhere. Here's the, uh, a key quote. The view from nowhere is a bid for trust that advertises the viewlessness of the news producer. And I, w I wanted to include this, this image here on the right. Um, and I want to focus not on the basketball player on the left, who's the legendary Wilt Chamberlain, um, but the guy on the right, the, uh, the referee. Um, and we want, journal we want journalists to be referees, right? We want people to, to be witnesses to the world around us. Um, a 2007 study found that white basketball referees call more fouls against black players and to a lesser extent, black referees call more fouls against white players. <laughs> um, we may never get to true objectivity in uh, basketball or journalism, um, but it's important to take inventory, uh, to be thoughtful about our prejudices, be non-defensive about our prejudices, um, and it's important because um, too often journalists um, women journalists and journalists of color were seen as less objective than white male journalists. But in fact, it's important to know that from white uh, referees and black referees, nobody is perfect. <laughs> we're all flawed. Um, but we're capable of working on our flaws. And if we're aware that we're flawed, we can minimize our flaws. One way I talk about hidden perspective um, with students is I ask them to talk about a, an issue of national importance, an issue that's important to them. 
And then I try to play with their sense of self. So I ask them to pick like a number between one and three, and I say, um, and, and then I ask them to pick a bunch of numbers, including the number of between one and 40, and I say, okay, now you're from one of these 40 countries. These are the 40 most populous countries um, in the world. So if someone picked um, 32, they're from Argentina. So I ask them to think about their, um, the way they thought of the most important issue to them politically, and I say, now you're from Argentina. How do you think about it? Now, obviously, they don't know too much about what it's like to be in Argentina, they, um, but I also you know, have them play with the idea of their gender, their health, their wealth, um, um, you know, how, how, how much they have access to clean water, healthcare, things like that. Um, and in this way, we can start to unpack whether we bring um, perspectives that, that even surprise us. Um, one uh, interesting way uh, to think about perspective is to remember that journalism is an active process. Journalists are people who make things. We don't make things up. We stick to facts. We follow science. We listen. Um, but we do decide what's included in stories. Um, and there's a great model um, of objective uh, journalism that's presented by a guy named Daniel Hallen, who's written about objective journalism as it relates to the, un, uh, to the Vietnam War. He wrote a book called The Uncensored War. Um, and he looks at this model for objective journalism, and it's a reminder that journalists create the conceptual framework for the stories that they work on. Um, and so in the inner sphere, it's called a sphere of legitimate controversy. This is where things get debated. So when you read an article about infrastructure bill, you might get two different perspectives or multiple perspectives. Uh, tax policy, things that are debated in Washington every day. Um, and these spheres are fluid. Um, you know, th some things don't get included. For example, if I'm a, an editor, I'm sending you out as a reporter to cover a murder, I don't say, don't come back till you get me a pro-murder story. Right? A pro-murder uh, view, that would be insane, right? You would never have that. Um, that would be, in Hallen's uh, configuration, the sphere of deviance. Um, and this, these spheres change from um, year to year in our lifetimes. Um, in 20 years ago, um, we know that, uh, that same-sex marriage was not really debated uh, in the mainstream press, then it became a sphere of legitimate controversy, and now today, certainly on most college campuses and certainly among young, most young people, it's a sphere of consensus view that same-sex marriage uh, should be protected. So these things shift over time, um, but it's really important to remember that, um, that we, uh, even though we strive to be um, detached, nonpartisan, scientific, empathetic, um, and fair elements classically uh, that make up objectivity, um, that an Achilles shield is never possible. Which, um, but we have to, um, we have to uh, uh, strive for that in a way that we respect everybody. And res the word respect uh, leads me to my fourth and final practice uh, journalists must assert a respectful um, examination of some of these issues that I talked about today. Equality, systemic racism, and other issues uh, central to the mission of journalism. In 2018, a uh, radio show, which is my favorite radio show, um, uh, it's called Reveal, uh, conducted an investigation of banking practices um, around the country. Um, it turns out that redlining uh, still, the effects of redlining still exist, that, um, that African Americans have harder time getting loans, uh, and when they get the loans, they often pay more than, than whites with exact identical credit scores. Um, and just this month, um, Reveal, in a very respectful way, uh, conducted a seven-part series on the killing of a black teenager in Mississippi. 
and offered, um, I think they're on, on um, episode four this week, they, um, they offered a, a great history lesson, went into depth, and again, we're spending seven hours on this topic. And Al Letson, um, the host, uh, started one of his shows um, with this comment. Before we start, you and I, dear reader, need to have a covenant between us. There are a ton of true crime podcasts out there. Some are really great. But, that's what, but if that's what you're looking for, I encourage you to find those because this is not that show. I'm not interested in commodifying black death. I'm interested in looking at the system and understanding it so that change may be implemented. I'm asking you to go on that journey with us, but always remember that Billy Joe Johnson was not a character in a podcast you love, but was a human being whose life mattered. And that's why we want to understand his death. And Al Ledson's deep respect for the story and his deep respect for his subject um, is wonderful. But we, it, w the other piece of it, though, is that respect has to be met by us. And it has to be met by our demand that you and I, as consumers of journalism, need to demand a, ref uh, a, a mirror that reflects um, fairly. We need to pay for great journalism and um, a great journalism that offers a fair, equitable, and better mirror. So thank you. I understand we have some time for, for questions and discussion. Please. Yeah. Thank you so much, David, um, for your compelling talk. You've given us a lot to process, a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, we have um, a good bit of time left for questions. Um, I ask that everybody who um, would like to ask a question um, uses one of the microphones that we set up over there and over there. Um, so please walk to the closest microphone. Um, if uh, that poses a challenge, uh, we can um, definitely um, pick up the question and um, maybe, David, you can repeat it into the microphone. This is for the sake of uh, our recording and also, of course, for um, understanding one another um, most clearly. Okay, thank you. Um, are you okay with taking the questions? Absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah. Hello. Hi, Hi David, thanks for that uh, talk. That was awesome. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit about how uh, trust in journalism and trust in media has really dropped, even in the last few years, even amongst people who would be the consumers of, or, or would be most inclined to sort of demand reform. And then as a corollary, I think this is a really interesting quote you put here, because these like true crime podcasts are probably way more popular than even, say, Reveal is. Or, and so I'm wondering, you know, if, if the demand isn't there, how, how do we sort of go about fixing uh, journalism, or yeah, those are two a a excellent questions. So, um, so we're losing respect from um, from from many different quarters, right? Um, certainly, the right is you know listening to, and this is a nonpartisan statement, right? Uh, a president, uh, President Trump, who d disparaged the press, and I think he would admit to this, right? Disparaged the press on a on a daily basis. So we're seeing. Um, we're seeing, uh, you know, a loss of respect on the right. We're also seeing a loss of um, respect on the left as well and in the center, you know, that sometimes journalism isn't uh, serious enough and is too frivolous. Um, uh, journalists often will say, you know, I get it from both sides. I get it from the left, I get it from the right, so I must be doing something right. And uh, I have two kids, uh, and imagine... Um, that I would say, uh, my son thinks you know I'm terrible, and my daughter thinks I'm terrible. They both do. I must be doing something right. Like that doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so journalists have to listen um, uh, to criticism, and probably journalists don't do a good enough job of listening to criticism. But the second part of your question is really interesting, because. Um, you know, how do you exist in a media world where the true cr crime podcasts, right, are more popular, right? How do, you, how do you be serious when other people around you are not? Um, and it's compounded by uh, user choice, 
which um, now as uh, consumers, we, are, um, we have much more freedom to chart our own uh, media path, right? Uh, traditionally, um, you know, even if you were looking at the sports pages of a newspaper uh, and that's all you want to look at, you know, let's say you're 12 years old and you're looking at sports pages, but then you get the, the front page first and then you kind of maybe read a few articles and you read both sides. Um, the, the social media model in some ways uh, 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 gives you more um, voices than you ever had, but in some ways you can really um, just follow your own interests, which could have political implications if you're only looking at the left or only looking at the right. But also, you could be following um, you could be following your own interest into entertainment and sensationalism. So it's a really tough one. The one thing that I'll say is that you know, reveal might not ever be as popular as the uh, as the true crime podcasts, but we live in a media world where a reveal can still exist. Um, I mean, it can still exist if we still fund it, uh, and that's important. Local news is maybe in more jeopardy than the, some of the national um, uh, national outlets, but uh, but you know this this choice between giving people what they want and giving people what they need. It's always been the case, but it's maybe more acute now. I don't know if, if, if that uh, answered your question or if you had a follow-up. Oh, no, I think it did. I think it was interesting you brought that up because I started thinking about these journalists who've left the uh, in, you know, um, newspapers and started their sub stacks, and now they're starting to stay really concentrated on one idea. Or, and so it is interesting. And, and then they're, they're showing that that's something that's viable, that people yeah. are willing to pay for that. Yeah. So thank and, you. And, you know, um, and we... Uh, uh, you know, it's great that, that there'll always be this place for a really quality, um, uh, quality journalism in the form of a podcast or a Substack or whatever. Um, but uh, but yeah, we also have to be worried that that, that too many people are getting their stuff um, in sensational ways uh, that are not serious or not accurate. Right? Um, these are great questions. Uh, yeah. Hey, David, thanks. Okay. That was great. I, I, I hadn't thought so much about the disaggregation that you just brought up. I mean, the difference between looking at a classical newspaper and just kind of targeting, I just want to learn about the Celtics. Um, and, uh, and so I guess I, I, I wonder, so there are two things I wonder. I mean, you, your, your talk is a, is a little bit about what kinds of things people or whatever, uh, entities choose to publish and make news, and then about how you report that news. And in a world where a lot of news is disaggregated in the way that you say, I mean, it can be part of a larger, I mean, website, whatever it is, or on the other hand, it can just be part of some non-curated but nevertheless delivered piece of news with no larger media context, right? So that the question of which lives matter in the news, in some sense, if you don't actually care how the news is delivered to you, kind of comes back to search engines and what they deliver to you uh, when you search for quote unquote news or an article, let's say about a missing person or a missing woman, because I think, uh, sorry for, maybe this is more of a statement, but I, 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 I want your reaction. I mean, there's some argument to be made that everything gets reported now. Um, right. And, uh, but the, but, and the issue becomes whether or not you ever see it. Um, so that, I, I guess what I'm saying, I wonder a little bit if, if part of this is about, part of your talk relates to classical delivery of news and then how that question is now transformed in the current environment and the way in which news does reach us ultimately. Yeah, so that's a really provocative and interesting idea, like um, uh, that maybe the Achilles shield, the, uh, the, the thing that reflects the whole world, you could say is the internet, right? There's like a place for, um, you know, the person of color who's missing, uh, we can't, we can say, okay, well, Gabby Petito is getting lots of attention, but somebody somewhere is also talking about, um, you know, the person who is not on the front page. 
of uh, the New York Post, um, but is somehow reflected. Uh, and in some ways, you know, we can say that if you have, there's a viewer or reader interest, um, you can get almost everything. Uh, and so that's kind of exciting um, to think about. Uh, and for, you know, I just spoke with some of your fellows who are doing fascinating work on, on topics that, that I'm sure they can go to the internet and, and find lots of uh, information about their really important research areas. So the internet allows you to dive in deep about any topic you want. And part of it, I guess, is, is amplification, right? So, um, so what stories, if, if everything now can be found, what stories are being amplified? And this is uh, you know, something with the Facebook papers that just came out in the last uh, few weeks um, that, the, that Facebook and other social media outlets are amplifying in ways that could be detrimental to society, right? Um, and even though we can see any place um, in the world, going back to the, uh, uh, the map, um, what are the places that we actually pay attention to? Um, and the map um, really doesn't, the, the, the shield doesn't reflect, you know, when, when it comes down to it, uh, the shield doesn't reflect large parts of the world. Um, and so amplification, um, amplification is, is, is key and also uh, uh, reader uh, interest as well. Um, we, uh, not only is our, wor our world is rewired, right, in, in, in profound ways, but we're not rewired. Uh, like we need, to, we need to do a better job of caring about uh, what happens in Chile, to, to come back to the London tabloid, uh, that nothing ever happens in Chile. We have to care about what happens in Chile a little bit more. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I think my question gets to exactly what you were just saying about how the world has become rewired, but we as news consumers maybe haven't become as rewired as the world. Um, so my question, and I come from a journalism background, so this is coming from a conversation that I had with an editor here in New England um, recently where I was really stumped on how to respond to the feedback and the pushback that this editor was receiving from the white part of her audience as she was trying to cover the Black Lives Matter protests last year and this year, and was also doing things like bringing the Latino culture shows and music shows into more prominent time slots on her public radio station. And she was sharing with me the feedback that she was receiving from the longtime supporters of her public radio station, who were progressives themselves. And they were saying things like, I don't need to be told what the African American community cares about. You know, I marched in the civil rights movement in the 60s, and I don't need to turn on my public radio station and be reminded of my white guilt and my white privilege. And so my question is sort of, you know, what does history and your perspective teach us about how that editor should respond in that moment? And whether there's kind of a gain or education that can happen in that moment with those listeners, or whether there's some part of the conversation that just, you know, maybe that listener isn't ready or, you know, isn't quite, their mind can't quite be moved, or they might end up no longer being a listener of that public radio station. There was this tension um, that I would love to hear your perspective on. Yeah, I Thank mean, um, uh, my boss a few few years ago said to me, "You can't please everybody," <laughs> and I think I mean that's, that sounds like a cop out, I guess. But uh, but uh, I always think about you know how much I've been listening to um, Vermont Public Radio and now WHYY in, in uh, Philadelphia, um, and every once in a while the station managers will get on the air and say, you know, we've uh, we're not going to be playing this show, but we're going to be playing that. And I know that they get tons and tons of mail, no matter what change they make, right? Uh, well, they're going to listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me at noon instead of at 10. Oh, no, you know. Um, so people don't like change. Um, uh, you know, it, again, I think it comes down to the responsibility of the station manager to think not only what the, what the people want, but what they need. Maybe it's, you know... Uh, Radio is, is really interesting, is changing in really interesting ways though now that um, most people don't do appointment radio anymore. Um, 
so if you know if it's stream if it's if you can stream it, it almost doesn't matter as much. Um, and podcasts have really, in some ways, particularly for younger uh, listeners, uh, have 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 uh, replaced uh, appointment um, uh, radio. Um, but actually, I'm I'm kind of curious to what you uh, how you'd answer it. <laughs> sorry, sorry to get you off again. You're going to put me on the spot. I didn't have a great answer, but luckily um, I was with a colleague, and both of them were journalists of color, and I, as a white person, was sort of trying to listen, first of all, because they both have had you know, a lot more experience in this area than I had just by being who they are and doing the work that you know, we're all doing in journalism. So um, essentially what this station manager ended up saying is that she has, uh, she's turned down funding from you know, supporters and funders who uh, don't see the efforts that the station is making in the context of trying to make that more accurate reflection of society. So that's how she articulates her vision to her audience. And um, I think she entertains healthy debate and concerns about that, but, you know, also realizes if, if folks choose not to send their funding or, you know, choose to go elsewhere for their news, that there's only so much she can do, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent answer. And, you know, uh, if a university um, uh, gets a, a ton of money from somebody who says, I want you to, you know, open up the, a Holocaust denial center, right? The university is going to say, sorry, you know, we're, we're not in that business. Um, and we're not, you know, we're not going to take our cues um, uh, from everybody, right? Um, so uh, there has to be a match in a university. There has to be a match in um, in what the um, what the radio station is trying to put forth and the listener um, uh, listener demands. Um, the New Yorker famously used to say, "You know, we write we write our we create our magazine for ourselves. If anyone else wants to listen, that's fine." <laughs> um, now, obviously, in, in the media world, you can't do that if you have to depend on funding um, and an audience. But to some extent, you know, we should, um, as uh, journalists, as educators, uh, as people in the public, just understand that we should be, we should be elevating. We should be um, living up to a vision of journalism that includes holding leaders accountable, introducing um, various parts of community to each other, uh, listening better, um, uh, uplifting a conversation, and underscoring that we share a common humanity. Um, and if, I mean, that's just my quick list, but you know, there should, I'm sure that um, New Hampshire Public Radio has a list, uh, and if it ad adheres to that and opens up the conversation and understands that, as James Baldwin says, the world is not, is not white any longer, or maybe never was, but certainly, um, we have to understand that we live in a diverse world, um, and if some listeners don't like it, they can they can leave. Yeah. Uh, thank I'll I'll thank you also for your talk. <laughs> um, so, um, I guess my question is uh, like in some ways about polarization and how that's happening. So we have a situation. Let's use George Floyd for example, where you have irrefutable evidence about what happened, anyone who, watch, anyone who kind of watches that video can't deny. Um, and yet there's an immediate uh, backlash from, well, there's you know the people who are rallying for George Floyd, but these, there's an immediate backlash for people who are, uh, you know, blue, blue Lives Matter and all of that. Right. Um, and so I guess my question is, how can, what can journalism do at, to be objective um, and show the kind of t capital T truth that we were talking about earlier, but also uh, knowing that there is this polarized public that kind of might need to be nudged uh, in a particular uh, direction that is more aligned with the capital T truth of what is going on. Right. Um, uh, the actor Will Smith was w once said in the... Um, uh, in an interview a few years back, saying there isn't more um, violence among unarmed black people today. There's more video, um, and you know, 
certainly we live in very violent times, um, but part of it is documenting, right? Part of it is making sure um, that the many George Floyds that have existed, um, you know, the many lynchings, I mean, I, I use that word carefully, but I think that it fits, that George Floyd was, was killed in an extra legal way, in a cruel way, um, and we see this repeated uh, over time. You know, we didn't, we didn't have a, uh, a video of, um, of Emmett Till, right? But we, we had that, um, uh, after the fact, we had uh, the mother um, asking for a, uh, an open casket in Jet Magazine publishing those images. Um, so we have to document um, both as citizen journalists holding up cell phones, uh, activists and journalists, we have to document things that we see. Sometimes balance is not appropriate, right? Um, uh, there's no real answer, I think, to uh, the killing of George Floyd. Um, uh, in terms of, you know, there's no, there's no other side. There's no fair, equal side. Um, so w one of the things that the last four or five years have, have complicated for journalism is that um, when faced with um, things that are not true, do you still use balance? Do you still try to, you, maybe you try to be fair to both sides, but balance sometimes is completely inappropriate. So. Um, so trying to figure out how to do that is actually a challenge for journalism um, that, uh, that maybe we haven't fully met yet. Thanks. Thank you so much for that amazing talk. I was very glad that you mentioned media monitoring and also the National Association of Black Journalists. And I have the question for you because I've been following um, media coalitions, mainly the National Hispanic Media Co Coalition for the last 20 years. And every year they published a report and really just counted how many people, how many Latinos are involved as in the production, in the direction and so on, on the screen. And um, during the last years they have not published these reports anymore. So I really think there was like a peak like 10 years ago and then it went down on primetime TV. Is that a similar tendency in journalism? And could you tell us a little bit about media activism and monitoring in journalism? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I know that there have been strides in the last 20 years, uh, but modest strides. But I think, uh, you know, I've, I've read in numerous places that, that the downturn in, um, in the health of media organizations has, um, has really hurt uh, journalists of color as well. I mean, there, there are more outlets um, uh, now on, on television um, for uh, Hispanic journalists, um, and there are more outlets you know, for, um, for journalists of color, um, but the, mo the gains are very modest, um, and uh, we need a, uh, a journalism that sustains um, uh, journalists of color moving on to the future. And part of that is like, is our responsibility, right? We need to pay for, for good journalism. Uh, we need to pay for journalism that offers diverse uh, views. Now, there have been strides. I mean, like, you know, if you look at the New York Times and its 1619 coverage, you know, um, and the, the journalism that followed it, it really does show that the New York Times is willing to enter a national conversation about race that, um, that they didn't, certainly in the images that I showed from the 1890s, the outrageous racist of the 1890s, um, and, and even more recent examples of the New York Times kind of ignoring, um, ignoring communities of color. But now, um, the success of some of the mainstream outlets um, also puts pressure uh, on minority press as well. So like the, the Washington Post, I understand, is much more diverse than it was. Uh, I showed all the president's men a few months ago to my uh, students, and all the president's men is, uh, depicts, the movie depicts like an all-white newsroom. Um, and, and in a city that's minority, uh, majority minority, um, an all-white newsroom is completely outrageous, right? 
but so but the strides that the Washington Post made um, also suggests that maybe the minority press in trying to fill that void, um, the voids are different now, right? The voids maybe are, are in some ways are less pronounced. Um, and so uh, the minority press in general um, might have a, a more difficult um, sell for minority communities because their minority communities are no longer completely shut out of uh, the national conversation. But still, you know, one of the things that we see though is uh, complete misperceptions about, um, about uh, in this, the case of what I was talking about, um, uh, you know, a black, um, uh, unarmed black victims being somehow culpable for the crimes that were committed against them. Um, this is a legacy of uh, decades and centuries of misperceptions. The misperceptions are still there, um, and even 1619 Project and others uh, really uh, are not up to the task of really undoing all those decades and centuries of, of racism. So uh, we don't have a journalism school here at Dartmouth, as you know, and I, I, but I, I am kind of curious. Um, you wrote those seven principles up on the board. They've, they're, for a while, they're from a while ago. I mean, so teaching journalism students now, uh, what are the principles? I mean, are they the same? And also, what do you find is, uh, is driving uh, undergraduate uh, journalism majors? Why, why are they in the room? Yeah, they're, they're in the room for all kinds of reasons, right? Some of them want to be those referees. They want to be the people who, um, they want to be the people who, uh, um, you know, tell a story that's detached and reliable and, and doesn't have a political point of view. Some of them want to change the community. Some of them want to just take, get their journalism degree and then work for a nonprofit and, uh, some of them want to be activists. Um, I, I know that, that journalists, journalism students are more energized than I've ever seen them, which is really exciting. I mean, there, there are fewer, right? Um, we used to have at Temple like six or 700 majors. Now we have about 400 majors. So it, it's declined. Um, and so maybe we're just getting the most passionate ones, right? The people who just can't do anything else. Um, but they do come for a whole bunch of reasons, and, and the reasons are much more urgent and much more political than, you know, I, I'm here to, to write, a, you know, a 5W lead, you know. It's, uh, they, they want to change the world. And, and maybe that's endemic of, of every major and every college student. Maybe we're seeing more idealism now. Um, but certainly... Um, the initiatives that um, my colleague Jillian Bauer-Reese, who does the Kensington stuff, um, uh, are resonating. Like people want to go into a community and listen to what people have to say, tell a different story than just a story of crime and drugs, and listen. And I think that that you know the idea of like checking your arrogance at the door and like saying I'm not going to parachute into this community, I'm going to listen to what they have to say, is really exciting. Um, so it's it's all all the reasons. Um, but there's, even though there's a lot of different reasons, there's a lot more passion than I've ever seen, and it's it's exciting. <laughs>